Welcome to the Schmidt House Podcast. I'm your host, Zach. And on today's episode, I'm continuing my Harry Potter series with the fourth book slash movie, The Goblet of Fire. And in honor of Harry Potter's birthday being July 31st, I thought I would release an episode on that date. So you get two Harry Potter episodes this month. I'm really enjoying talking about Harry Potter and rereading the books. So without further ado, here's my review of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. For this review, I listened to this book on audiobook just to save some time. So if you want to follow along with me through this read through, I have it linked in the description box on a website that you can find uh, a copy of the audiobooks on. I listened to the Stephen Fry version, but the Jim Dale version is just as good. Um, I have listened to that one in the past, but uh, I'm currently I'm listening to the Stephen Fry versions. Um, I'm going to talk about the book first, and then the movie, and then finish with uh, some overall, uh, for, for like a general overview type thing. And uh, yeah, now we're going to talk about the Goblet of Fire. So right off the bat, uh, the original cover for this book is the best cover of any of the books. I really like the dragon and Harry flying his broom during the first task and going after the golden egg. Um, like the the cover itself, I think probably really attracted a ton of readers to the novel uh, back when they first came out. And this uh, this book, uh, it's it had a very different open, and it was um, it was a very welcome different start of the book, where we get a story from a different perspective. We aren't opening with Harry, um, and there truly hasn't been a chapter like this since the first chapter of the first book. Um, but it'd be really interesting. Well, like when I was going through this, it'd be really interesting to see if she wrote, um, you know, the last two books had an open in a similar fashion where we got to see different events and stuff like that. Um, in this book, we get the story of how Tom Riddle murdered his muggle, uh, father's family and, and essentially it sets up implications later on in the story. But it also had me thinking about the series and how it would feel if there was point of view characters outside of Harry and um, being able to tell the story in a similar fashion of how George R. R. Martin does A Song of Ice and Fire and how that's written. Um, that was kind of one of the takeaways when I was um, uh, listening to this book. We also get to meet um, the Diggeries. Um, and I found it kind of like a little bit melancho- melancholy. Cedric's dad says that um, it'll be a story to tell Cedric's grandchildren, referring to him beating Harry Potter at Quidditch. And it really does show a touch of optimism for posterity. And you never know what the future will hold for your kids. And no one would expect to have your 17-year-old die so early in, in their life and to such horrible ends as well. The tents that the crew stay in at the Quidditch World Cup are really cool um it's even when i first read that way back when something that i always thought would just be perfect to be able to go camping and you basically have you know a tiny little tent you go in and it's this giant thing um i know it defies physics but it would be really cool to have in in real life in chapter nine the dark the dark mark uh this is the first chapter in the series where we really get to see some more mature and horrific events taking place uh, specifically when the Death Eaters are torturing muggles. There's definitely parallels between them and the KKK in the past. You know, they got hoods and masks and ultimately just a blind hatred for people that are different than them. And after this chapter, you can tell that things are, are heading in a dark direction and that this book is going to be significantly different than the other entries. Um, it also seems that Um, this book really starts to get into larger social metaphors as well. I know they touched upon like, um, mudbloods and stuff like that in the second one, but this one, it, and and I guess werewolves in the third, but it really is, um, coming to light lots of those, um, you know, larger social themes and, and whatnot. I wonder at what point in the series she came up with the unforgivable curses. Uh, obviously she had the idea for the killing curse, um, since the start, um, is obviously that's the main component of Harry's backstory. But there are also some very harsh spells that don't meet that same category. Like, for example, a simple fire spell such as Incendio could kill someone just as easily as Avada Kedavra. Or Snape's uh, spell, Sectum Semper, that we learned about in the sixth book, could be just as lethal as well. So I'm wondering why they have a category for these specific spells Um, maybe it's because the unforgivable curses are maybe unblockable or at least very difficult to block. 
uh, unless I guess you have pot armor like Harry does, um, or effects, you know, he has effects like, uh, Prairie and Cantatum with his wand, um, and, you know, interacting with Voldemort. He's also a heart Horcrux, uh, the love of his mother defended him when he was a child. So there's little things like that, but it seems that there'd also be other ways that could be, um, other spells that could be just as harmful as the unforgivable ones. JK Rowling also likes funny acronyms. So she's got things like spew, which is Hermione's, um, house elf, um, elvish rites, uh, group newts and owls, which are like the testing components for, uh, for wizards. It's just kind of funny how she kind of threw some odd acronyms. Uh, one question that I had was what is Hogwarts mode of transportation to getting to the other schools in the trial wizard tournament? Would they just use the Hogwarts express? Um, you know, Durmstrang has the ship and, um, Boba, or Bobatons has, um, that little carriage with the, the Palomino horses, the winged Palomino horses. Um, you know, would they do that? And realistically, the Hogwarts Express also would seem a little bit more, more modern if this is a tournament that they haven't had for a very long time. I can't remember how long it, but I'm pretty sure it was like a hundred years or more, you know, trains wouldn't have been as popular back then. So that was one question I had when, when going through it. I feel really bad for Harry when his name gets drawn out of the Goblet of Fire. There's so many negative implications for something that he is honestly, like, innocent in. Especially, like, when, he, like, he loses his best friend with Ron's whole drama around um, being overshadowed by Harry yet again. And Hermione is legitimately the best of the trio. Uh, they wouldn't have had the success that they have had without her. Uh, she helps... Um, she does so many little things that helps Harry get through not just this, uh, these hard times in this book, but um, she also helps him more than anything else, I feel, especially while Ron's kind of ignoring everything. And I think that their friendship is really important uh, in this book, and it lays the foundation for probably some of those shippers that wanted Harry and Hermione to end up together and like are really gung-ho about that. I kind of agree with that. Not that I'm in the hard shipper camp, but I just think that Harry and Hermione do align a lot more. Um, they fit better than, I would say, Ron and Hermione do, or Harry and Ginny. Um, that's just kind of my thoughts on it. I, I really do think that those two should have ended up together, but uh, whatever. Um, the Weighing of the Wands. Uh, this was actually a chapter when I was going through it again. I appreciated it a little bit more. Uh, this was a very good opportunity to do some world building. Um, we get larger uh, explanations on wand lore, which is something good to see. But to be honest, it shouldn't have taken her four books to finally do some serious world building. World building, like including other uh, European wizarding schools and, and um, you know, the Quidditch World Cup and just seeing different cultures and stuff like that. It really made the world feel that much more lived in than she had done in the past. The first task of the Triwizard Tournament would also be, in my opinion, the most dangerous and the most exciting to watch in comparison to the other two. I know the other ones are dangerous, but having to go up against a female dragon garden, guarding her eggs, I think uh, kind of outweighs some of the other dangers that are in the other, other ones, especially in considering um, the film side of it, not so much the, the books, because there are other dangers that aren't included in the films that are in the books. With the whole house elf plotline, um, you know, it's my question was, is how come we never heard about the house elves being at Hogwarts up until the fourth year, especially considering how frequently that Hermione brings up a history of Hogwarts, the book she's always talking about. You would think that they would probably have had something in that book. Um, you know, also Ron comes up with the house elf liberation front, which I think is a better name than SPEW. Uh, but yeah, I think it would also in the, in the movie, it would have been really cool to see the school kitchen, but the whole house elf plotline was scrapped. I'm assuming for, for time purposes, there's a lot of suspect stuff around Moody that Harry doesn't even begin to question. Um, he does maintain a certain level of trust with him, which causes him to probably overlook some of the things that, uh, he comes across. Um, Earlier in uh, in the chapter where Moody uh, takes the map from Harry, 
Harry is talking about how important the map is and how useful of an object it is, but he's just willing to give it away to Moody without any protest. And I'm sure that Harry knew that he was, had no power in the situation because Moody could ultimately just trump him being a teacher and saying that, oh, well, we're going to take you to Dumbledore or something like that and get it all sorted out, which would have more negative impl implications than letting Moody take it. But uh, in the situation, Moody knows that he can't give it back to Harry because his cover would be blown. And he plays it off really well um, in the book. I mean, the... Um, the way that Moody is presented in the book, you get completely sideswiped by it. So it's like all of those little things, the reader themselves, not just Harry, is willing to overlook lots of the things just absentmindedly because the way that she structured the reveal in the end is so well done um, in the books, uh, definitely not in the movie. After the big reveal at the end of the book, uh, the line that Moody says about hating Death Eaters that got away, uh, it hits so much harder. But it's also weird that Harry wouldn't want to have the map back, even just to check on Crouch again. He just kind of takes Moody's word for it. But again, it'd be very difficult for him to escape this. So um, there's just a couple of things that really conveniently played out for Moody's benefit. The second task is uh, also a little bit more elaborate in the book in comparison to the movie. There's... Uh, a lot of little visual and descriptive things that take place down there, like Moaning Myrtle finds her way down there somehow. Um, this is one chapter that I feel is better in the books, uh, everything revolving around the second task. There are also uh, early levels of jealousy from Ron towards the attention um, of Hermione that plays out in this book, specifically around Victor Crumb. Um, you know, in the sixth book, it's kind of opposite. Hermione's trying to get Ron's attention, um, you know, and they ultimately do end up together. But it's just kind of, she starts laying those little seeds of their relationship, which is kind of cool to see uh, Ron's jealousy towards Hermione. Uh, J.K. Rowling is, uh, is really good at red herrings. She puts essentially one major one. There's also, you know, other ones that uh, are in there, but she puts one major one in each book. A red herring is uh, essentially a literary device or a logic fallacy of trying to divert the attention of the reader away from the truth by building up ev evidence towards something else, or in this case, someone else. So in the books, uh, the first one is uh, Snape is the red herring over Quirrell. Book two is Malfoy over Ginny. Three is Sirius over Pettigrew. And the fourth one is Bagman and Crouch over Crouch Jr., uh, Igor Karkaroff as well, but they, that gets snipped out pretty, pretty quickly. I guess Snape could also maybe be thrown in the mix too, just cause he is also an ex death eater, but there's a lot more too serious in the books when compared to the movie. And it really helps progress his character. You really forget, um, about him for the most part in the movie, but he is, uh, he's essentially only in one scene in the movie and mentioned in another, uh, so completely ignored, but in the book, there's practically a whole chapter that features Sirius, and uh, we get a bunch of background info on him, other characters, uh, as well as they're kind of trying to spitball ideas and kind of solve some mysterious things. Uh, but it really develops him as a character, and it furthers his relationship with Harry. Uh, as Sirius is one of my favorite characters, it would have been nice to be able to have uh, the trio meeting him in the cave near Hogsmeade in the movie. Um, and also Sirius, um, shows up at the end of the book as well. Something again, just completely ignored by the movie, uh, that again, just kind of aids to lots of his character development and explanations for things that essentially are just like shoehorned in or completely ignored, uh, by the, the person who's seeing the movie, um, are just supposed to accept without any explanation that are just thrown in the, in the fifth movie. All of that stuff is all fleshed out really, really well in the book. So that's kind of just like sad to see the just lots of that component kind of completely ignored. Uh, through this read through, I also forgot that uh, in one of the Care of Magical Creatures classes, there are Nifflers. So many of you that have um, watched the Fantastic Beast films, one of Newt Scamander's main um, sidekicks um, that's a beast is a Niffler. Um, obviously, this wasn't included in the movie. But it was um, it was nice hearing about Nifflers, and they are really cool creatures that like treasure. It would be both fu uh, very fun and very annoying to have as a pet. I also have a feeling that Dumbledore, um, he had he planned for 
Harry's curiosity to be able to experience certain things that would help him out on the journey. Um, in this book, it's revolving around the pensive. You wouldn't expect uh, Dumbledore to haphazardly leave um, important artifacts such as the pensive um, that contain specifically his um, most important memories and stuff like that, kind of perfectly queued up and ready to go um, to contain a memory of um, Barty Crouch Jr. and uh, Crouch Sr. too, I guess, and Igor Karkaroff. Um, it just seems kind of like too convenient, um, even from a, like a plot perspective, but it's like almost like Dumbledore is kind of trying to nudge Harry in the right direction on certain things. Um, also how cool would it be to actually have a pensive in real life, being able to relive some memories and stuff like that. And, you know, even if it's like being able to fact check when you get in an argument with your friends or something like that, you just check the pensive and, and there you go. You have your answer. Um, I remember the uh the chapters in the graveyard being some of the most intriguing and enjoyable chapters in the Harry Potter books up until that point there were certain things about that as a child that really made me think and have to put a bunch of things together and really try to solve um kind of try to solve the puzzle earlier try to see what they're getting at and there's also lots of excitement when when i was reading it um you also are faced with kind of like the first major death of the series that being cedric um, through the entire book, essentially, it's just trying to build up, um, Cedric's character of being like a good person and helpful and caring and all of these like admirable qualities that a person would have. And then it's just like, you would, you see him die or you, you read him die. And it's actually like, you get, you know, you really do end up liking the character, even though he's kind of in competition with Harry. And to kind of have that happen, especially as a kid reading it, it kind of really like shifts your your focus and you get to, to take a look at the series and be like, this is heading in a completely different direction than like your typical kid's novel. Um, so that is um, kind of just different to experience. Um, I also would have, think, would have said that back when I was a kid reading these, that the graveyard scenes were... So, and and also the reveal at the end uh, were like my favorite chapters uh, back then. They're extremely descriptive and, and keep you on the edge of your seat. Like nothing that she's ever wrote prior to this, especially when, you know, faced with Voldemort's return. Uh, this book is very strong on multiple accounts and reading it for the first time uh, around, I'm sure it had you on the edge of your seat. The The moody reveal at the end was probably like nothing that you've ever, ever read before, at least in a, in a Harry Potter novel. And even rereading it this time around, it really made me appreciate this book um, so much more than I maybe did before or when I was trying to stack it up and compare it with others in the, um, in the series. The second chapter in this book is a little bit too much exposition. I think at this point, and I'm pretty sure I said this of the last book as well. At this point, she doesn't have to sum up the previous books. Uh, we know, or she knew how popular this was. And even if people um, haven't read the books in a while, everybody understands the story of Harry Potter. And they for sure aren't going to start with the fourth book in the series. So there's a whole bunch of exposition that I think is just um, unnecessary. This whole chapter could be essentially diluted down to two paragraphs and then just go on to the next kind of event. That would have been a good way to shorten it up just a little bit. Um, especially cause you're basically summing up everything that we already know. Um, there are also a ton of exposition when we get back to Hogwarts. And I think this book specifically could have benefited from less exposition, especially when noting the size of the book in comparison to the previous entries, it probably just would have flowed a little bit better in the series. It also took uh, her essentially four books to do any sort of world building uh, to a certain extent, she almost painted herself in a corner by having, um, you know, just such an extreme focus on the British wizarding world. If she didn't address the overall wizarding world, it almost would have just uh, been another, like, strike against her, essentially. Also, why wouldn't they have included Quidditch this year? It would have been a good thing to showcase with all of the extra spectators at Hogwarts for the Triwizard Tournament. Then they even could have had an inter-school competition um, outside of, like, the regular four houses at Hogwarts. Um, in fact, like, why wouldn't they do that anyways? Just take the best seven Hogwarts, um, Quidditch players to compete against the, ev the other schools every single year. 
right? It wouldn't be hard to even just arrange a port key to be able to send the, the students and a teacher to be able to play the game and whatnot. Um, you know, for the Wizarding World's only major sport, why wouldn't they put a bigger emphasis on it um, overall? Um, but like I've said this many times before, uh, J.K. Rowling's least favorite part about writing the books was Quidditch, so it's not a surprise why she just, you know, wanted to, to get rid of it. Uh, this book's uh, only major fault is just with a few minor plot holes, specifically around uh, Moody and Voldemort's plan. But other than that, um, this book, is, um, especially the ending, is incredibly good. Um, I think after rereading this this time around, um, it jumped up significantly um, higher than I would have pegged it going into this reread. And now on to the movie. So I'm going to open this by saying that this is the absolute worst Harry Potter movie in the Harry Potter films. Sure, it's better than the Fantastic Beasts, but I don't take those into any consideration whatsoever. The director, Mike Newell, didn't care to even read the books or the previous book, sorry, read this book or any of the previous books in preparation to direct it, which I think is a huge fault. There are some serious problems with this movie, and I'm probably going to spend the majority of the time ragging on it, so if you're a big fan of this movie, uh, I'm sorry in advance. The opening uh, with the theme song and uh, the music is a really cool way to start the film. Um, the song from the score is called uh, Journey Continues, and it pretty much is the only good or memorable track from the score. From a pacing perspective, it does make sense to skip the Dursleys, or the scenes with the Dursleys. Uh, Brendan Gleeson is a good cast for uh, Mad-Eye Moody. His hair probably could have been a little bit more gray as the way that they describe it in the books, but that's really just nitpicking. Uh, same with some of the other characters. With the exception of Madame Maxine, I thought the casting in these movies were really good. Although through this rewatch, Crouch Sr., I noticed there are some points where it was very poorly active and some of the mannerisms and stuff like that is just comes off weird and out of character. If you know the character in the books, uh, it doesn't translate over nearly as well. But the best of the bunch is for sure Ray, uh, Ray Fiennes from, or as, um, as Lord Voldemort. I think, uh, you know, they could have made him a little bit more book accurate, but realistically, that was probably just a little bit too scary for the younger audience that they were probably trying to attract, even though there are, you know, darker themes and whatnot. But, um, you know, he's really accurate in the role and he crushes it uh, from an acting standpoint. It's He's probably the biggest standout as far as new characters that are introduced in this film. The Yule Ball scene also translates over quite well when adapted to film. It's probably like if you look at the side-by-side -side comparison, it's probably one of the better things that they were actually able to take from the books, but they just spent a little bit too much time on it. Visually, this movie is also like really good. You can't take that away from it. The you know the CGI on, on the dragons and stuff like that, uh, really well. You know, the aesthetics of Hogwarts, really good. The outfits of um, the champions and even the um, students from the other schools, again, all really good. Like I can't slide it for that. I wish we did get to see more of the full-size dragons. You know, we only see the Hungarian horned tail that Harry has to fight. And I understand it really would have drained the visual effects budget, but it would have been cool to see um, all four dragons. I like the inclusion of uh, Fred and George's gambling in lieu of the story arc with Ludo Bagman um, and him refusing to pay uh, their winnings for betting on the Quidditch World Cup. Having them still kind of have that component to it, it, it helps kind of make up for, you know, axing kind of another little subplot there. The look of the mer people in the movie was something that I didn't like when I first saw the movie, but watching it now, I think it works really well. I know as a kid, when I was thinking about mermaids in Harry Potter, I was thinking of like more realistic ones like Little Mermaid or, um, you know, um, live action ones like in the movie Hook. Those type of mer people rather than what we got, which are more like, you know, if you were to say that mer people were 60, 40 human to fish, these ones were like 70, 30 fish to human, which again, I think it, it actually does work. I also liked, um, I thought it was cool that they gave the, them like a fish style vertical tail fins rather than the typical whale style fluke of the fin for the mer people. It was just a re really different aesthetic and it actually played out fairly well in my mind, you know, watching it again. The graveyard scene is also incredibly well done. Probably the most redeeming scene uh, scenes of the whole thing. 
Um, there's a lot to go over in those uh, chapters in the graveyard, and it hits most of the beats really well. So, um, you know, those, those aspects are, are some of the better ones. Amos Diggory's angst and sorrow for the death of his son was so well acted, and it's heartbreaking to watch. If you go watch the scenes of him crying over his son's dead body and him screaming in, in, in sorrow, is just, it's very powerful. Dan's acting was uh, also very, very good. Um, well, more so towards the end of the movie, like after the third task, so in the graveyard and the scenes that take place after, was by far his best acting in the series so far. The CGI on uh, Voldemort's transformation was also really cool, and it's worth rewatching in slow motion because there's lots of little details that evolve, like um, you know his ears and his nose, and just everything from transforming from that little gross little baby um, coming out of the cauldron into full fully fledged Lord Voldemort and stuff like that. When he opens his eyes, and you know, I don't know, it's just a really cool scene. Probably in my mind the best scene in the um in the movie also the credits were a lot were very creative much like the previous film where they used the marauders map this time they used the names coming out of the goblet of fire i thought it was a cool little touch just towards the end of the movie all right so now some of the bad things about the movie uh in the opening scene the of the movie they break away from the books and they reveal the mystery at the end of the book right off the bat David Tennant's Barty Crouch Jr. does not show up in the scene in the book, and it really makes you wonder why they chose to put him there because um, it will make his other appearances in the movie feel disjointed, especially with his tongue tick, which gives things away really early because he does it as Moody. Um, so it bas it gives away the whole plot twist. Um, it, it, was, it would be like in... in um, one of M. Night, M. Night Shyamalan's movies where he just gives away the, the plot twist right at the end. He just gives it to you right at the start. It would just derail the entire film. It doesn't do it as bad as that might happen, but realistically, if you're looking at that, especially from translating from book to movie, um, it just it just doesn't work. And, you know, I think had they left him out um, entirely from those scenes and you never saw him until the court scene and the final reveal, it would have made the movie instantly better. But, I mean... Yeah, it just I I don't understand why they chose to kind of do that. Maybe it was to make the reveal so they didn't have to explain as much because they kind of already showed you little bits and pieces along the way. But the book's not like that at all. Uh, it, it seems like one of the goals of the movie was to make Harry look as incompetent as possible. Just like every turn, there all of the other characters and some of the lines that they gave him just make him seem like it's he's like fresh off the boat and has no idea what's going on. It would have been cool to see scenes of the Weasleys at at uh, Privet Drive in the movie. It would be funny and chaotic, and it would be a really good way to start the movie. Um, you would have got the laughs that they were trying to inject in the whole movie. They would have got lots of them right off the bat, and you could have kept with uh, the more of the darker tone and the mystery of it throughout the thing instead of trying to jam-pack a bunch of comic relief like in chunks. Could have got some good laughs right off the start. Um, it also would have been really cool to see what Dudley's tongue would have looked like after eating the the ton tongue toffee candy, uh, and being able to see Mr. Weasley trying to fix it in that whole interaction. It just visually in my mind, one of the first time I saw the movie, I was like, I was expecting to see that scene because I was like, I want to see how they do that. Um, you know, just from like a visual effects standpoint, but unfortunately, not the way that it went. I think the movie also should have included uh, Bill and Charlie. Uh, Bill and Charlie Weasley, there are lots of enjoyable events that those characters have, um, you know, not just at the start of the book, but they show up later on in the books as well. Um, not just this book, I guess, too. They're fairly frequent um, in the later books, too. But I think that's one just incredibly missed opportunity, especially Charlie, who doesn't appear in anything in in the movies. When we first meet Cedric, he just jumps on screen from out of a tree and I don't understand why they chose to do that. It's just it's disjointed and goofy. I think they really should have included Ludo Bagman in the movie as well. They took aspects of his character and just applied them to Barty Crouch Jr. and Fudge. Um, there's just I think I don't think it would have been too much just to add them in or add him in. I guess they botched the Quidditch World Cup match so badly that it's embarrassing. The whole scene just seems. Um, as a way to almost introduce Crumb, which they would have 
done anyways, but it's like, why even bother with um, this whole open um, just to say, not even say how the match went. They don't even say who wins. They just are essentially back at camp bragging about Crumb. Um, yeah, it just seems like all hype and then just completely um, ignored. Um, then we jump to a frantic, fiery scene where the Death Eaters are, you know, lighting things on fire, which in the books, they're torturing muggles, which, again, I think would just add so much value to seeing how, you know, awful these people are. It would make you hate them. But we just get really disjointed scenes and, and, and messy scenes. Um, then we cut to Crouch Jr., who, again, we're not supposed to see, we're not supposed to know is there. Uh, during the scene, he's under an invisibility cloak, um, you know, he casts the dark mark and, and he almost seems he's like walking towards Harry before he spooked off. But it's just like, I, I think they could have hand, handled this, the whole Quidditch World Cup a lot better. Um, you know, and, you know, if they were able to do it with like a, a better pacing where it's not as choppy, you actually get to see the game itself. I think would have added a, a better result. We, everyone knew that this movie was going to be long. So, I mean, what would have been a two minute Quidditch match or a three minute Quidditch match, uh, you know, tagged onto it. I think it's just kind of silly to, to ignore it that way. Then we also get some more stupid scenes on the train, like Harry's awkwardness around Cho, which I guess, again, if we're just going to start focusing on teenage drama, it works, but um, it's just kind of silly and oversights like that. I think kind of derail the overall tone of the movie. Um, the awkwardness at the, the hour alert, Allery works really well, but just doing something simple on the train like that, it just like, why did you choose that scene when you could have focused on other things? And then Harry goes and writes a letter to Sirius addressing him on the letter, which makes no sense because Sirius is on the run and owls are going to get intercepted. So why would you write Sirius Black's name on the letter? Like, it's just, it's just silly. Also, why is everyone's hair so long? They all had short hair just a month ago when they ended school. Um, and it doesn't, and when you watch this, it the film doesn't hold up, and that is one of the reasons in my mind. It just makes everybody look like uh, awkward teenagers, and essentially that's what this movie is, is just an awkward teenager of the of the films. I also think that they should have included Winky, the house elf, in the movie. I get removing the spew hotline, or the spew plot line, but I think they should have included her, the, um in the scenes at the Quidditch World Cup, they could have had her just even off to the side. It would have just added more context to the end, and they could have brought her into the interrogation scene as well with Crouch at the end. It would have just added that much more connection to it. Um, I don't know. It also probably could have been could have been scrapped and still worked, but I just, I like, you have source material, you know, try to do your best to adapt it, you know, the best that you can. The start of the year feast uh, was also really accelerated. I can see why, but there are just problems with doing it this way. In addition to making the schools single gender, um, when they're actually co-ed, like in the books, they're both co-ed. Um, Drumstring has girls and Bobaton has um, boys. But in the in the movie, they kind of segregated it out, which I don't understand why. Um, they also, as like a way to introduce them, they made them do dances into the Great Hall. Also, the camera pans to the asses of the Bobaton underage girls, and it's kind of a weird thing to do. Like, I get it's trying to imply that that's where you're, you know, a, a teenager, a teenage boy might go to look, but in a movie, it's just a weird thing to kind of do, in my opinion. There's also way too much poorly landed comic relief in this movie, especially around Filch. He's shooting off cannons early. He's running through the Great Hall, like, high-kneeing it. Like, he's running hurdles and stuff like that. Like, I don't know why, but they just kind of made his character comic relief. Like, they could have almost just deleted him entirely from the film, and it would have not skipped a beat. Uh, I think the director and the screenwriter forgot that this is actually a school. I think there's only there's only one class that's shown in the movie, and that's the one where Moody is teaching the kids about unforgivable curses. And yeah, it's an important one, um, but I think this movie, more than any other in the entire series, features the least amount of classes. There's this weird, like, almost study session that they're doing in the Great Hall with Snape, which I'm wondering if they just 
they're like, well, we can't afford to do a, dun- a shot in the dungeons on the set that we've already built for the other movies. Um, let's just do it in the Great Hall. Like, they're teaching potions in the Great Hall. Like, it, just silly things that were just, just don't really fit. Also, both Patel sisters are not in Gryffindor. One of them is in Ravenclaw. So, again, that's just another point of breaking canon where they don't, they don't really care to, um, you know, stick to the source material. Also, why would they show a scene of Igor Karkaroff looking sketchy around the Goblet of Fire? It's almost like they tried to shoehorn him into being the red herring in the film, but it has zero payoff later and nobody really believes it. So that scene, um, it doesn't have any relevance in the film. And it's just like, I know he's one of the suspects in the books, but that whole whole kind of arc could have just been cut from the film. And again, it wouldn't have skipped the beat. And lots of these like little little cuts or like things that they chose to include, if they wouldn't have included them, we would have been able to actually do a lot more um, of more important things, in my opinion. Also, they gave away who the champions would be from the start of the term feast. They just panned to the four of them, um, you know, when they're kind of talking about the tournament. It's like they're just basically saying, all right, well, there's going to be no surprise in, in five minutes when we actually um, show who is actually the champion. I don't know. It just, again, obviously it's no mystery for people who read the books, but I'm sure there's lots of people that didn't read the books that go watch these movies. So it's like, why are you constantly giving away the reveal of something that's going to happen later and actually have some type of payoff? You just basically blow it all. It's like you almost thought the audience was too dumb to follow along with the movie. In the trophy room scene, Dumbledore does not yell in the book the way that he did in the film. In the books, he's quite calm and questioning rather than angry and accusatory. Um, this is also memed online a lot when people are talking about the the um, movie because in the books it says Dumbledore, Dumbledore said calmly. And in the books, he's yelling and screaming. Or in the movie, he's yelling and screaming. They also really butchered the visuals with Sirius in the fire. But to be fair, it's not much better in the next film either. In the scene where Mad-Eye Moody t- turns Malfoy into a ferret, plays out better in the books in comparison to the movie. Um, they could have just easily put the scene with Harry and Malfoy dueling and Hermione gets hit with a spell. It's a good scene and honestly would have been cool to see and it would have warranted a little bit more of the punishment that Moody does to Malfoy in turning him to, into a ferret than him just basically going to jinx him, j- jinx Harry behind his back. The first task really changed a lot, probably to add a little bit more action to the movie um, because the other tasks were honestly just boring. Um, But it just deviated a little bit too much from the book. The the dragon does not escape the enclosure and doesn't go fly around Hogwarts and smash up the bridge and all of that stuff. Um, I also didn't like the aesthetic of the dragon all that much. It wasn't what I expected, especially when you see like the beauty of the the cover art for the book. it's also a bit annoying that people in Hollywood do not know the difference between a dragon and a wyvern. Um, it seems that whenever they need a dragon, whether it's in Game of Thrones or like even a game like Skyrim, they say they're all dragons, but they're wyverns. The difference between a dragon and a wyvern is a dragon has four legs and wings, while a wyvern has two legs and wings. I guess, like again, like Smog in um, The Hobbit, same thing they all go to that aesthetic rather than what a real dragon is. So that, in my mind, is just kind of something that... And again, if you look at the cover art for the fourth book, you kind of see what the Hungarian Horned Hill, you know, could potentially look like. And I always, I do like that aesthetic over what we got in the film. But that's to each their own. Harry also doesn't want to celebrate and get all the glory after he wins the first task uh, in the books. But in the movie, it's really glorified... And the movie makes it a spectacle of it. Although I said that the Yule Ball scenes translated over really well, um, the ball itself did, but they spent too much around the Yule Ball portion of the movie, Um, especially like the dance scene. It just doesn't really add much other than to generate some cheap laughs with Ron dancing with McGonagall. Um, It seemed that they would rather waste time around that when they, again, could have focused on some more important events in the book. Just take that two or three minute chunk and add that on to being able to have something else take place at the end of the book, which is more important. I mentioned this a little bit before, but why are they all studying in the Great Hall with Snape watching over? The reason is because they needed more comic relief. They needed for Snape to smack Ron with a piece of parchment and shove Harry and Ron's noses in books. 
it's almost like they tried to make this movie a comedy, but it just ended up being a really bad comedy and it takes away from lots of the good parts of this movie. Crum and Hermione's relationship is also, it's creepy in the books, but it's way worse in the film. So if you see, there's a scene where uh, Hermione and Harry are talking on a bridge and um, there's a really weird comment that Hermione makes about their relationship being more of a physical relationship. Now, keep in mind, she's 14 and he's 17. So there's a decent little age gap in there. And he's also like an international Quidditch superstar. So that's like dating like a celebrity, essentially. I remember that when I was in high school, it was pretty frowned upon for a freshman to be dating a senior, especially if the senior was male. Um, so this just their relationship and the way that it's presented more so in the movie, but also in the book. It's just really weird, you know, and then the, in the very next scene, we get another really creepy relationship where Moaning Myrtle is checking out Harry in the bath and she's like scooching over him, him and like trying to see through the bubbles and like it's creepy, especially when you realize that the actor is like 20 some years older than uh, Daniel Radcliffe in the scene. It just that's like another tick for its awkwardly like over sexualized aspect of a teen movie. Um, and I know she's a ghost and, and whatnot, but still, it's really odd how they just made her interact with Harry in that scene. The Triwizard Test must also be incredibly boring to watch. Um, it's not a very good spectator sport. Perhaps they should have focused more on Quidditch. I mean, in the first task, Harry f like flies away with the dragon. In the second task, they're all underwater. In the third task, they have a giant maze. So nobody is really able to watch anything. Like... I I don't I don't really know why that this is such like a overhyped thing when it's literally the worst spectator sport. The film really struggles with some pacing problems um in the passing of time. It just feels really choppy. If you had no point of reference from like reading the books and understanding where you are plot wise, you would think that this whole movie takes place over like a month period. I mean, apart from maybe the Yule Ball, because you know that's Christmas, but there really isn't even snow on the ground at any point in the movie. And the second task takes place in winter. You basically get like a few scenes and then, uh, and like a few scenes revolving around one big plot line in between the second and third tasks. It's basically, we just jump from thing to thing to thing. Uh, and it just, it honestly does feel choppy. The pacing of this movie is probably the worst of any of the Harry Potter movies. In the pensive scene, they again take the opportunity to just throw away the final twist. They added in Barty Crouch Jr.'s tongue tick, and it gives away who Moody actually is, especially considering in the previous scene, you saw Moody do the exact same, um, you know, uh, tongue tick um, when faced with Barty Crouch Sr. Um, so essentially, you know who he is right then. So the 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 reveal at the end of the movie, it's like anybody that's actually been paying any sort of attention to the film is like, all right, I already know what's happening here. And for the life of me, I do not understand why they chose to do it this way. Um, because when you read the book, you're really caught off guard with the reveal. You, as a reader, are putting a lot of trust in Mad-Eye Moody. You know, he's an or, he's Dumbledore's friend, he's taken Harry under his ring, he did under his wing he does lots of good things in the book and then it's like when you find out that he's barter coach jr your world's rocked right is and and they even do it she does a very clever way in the graveyard of not giving away who like like aspects of that as well but in the film they just decided to between the opening scene um certain scenes in between the courtroom scene essentially right there you've already figured out the the big plot twist at the end of the book slash movie. So I don't know. It's, it's so weak. It's so weak. And this is probably, and this is probably, um, the biggest letdown of the entire film. They pissed away this right from the jump. And, and in my mind, there's no defending this because they, they really took one aspect of the, the books that was so well done and just did not care about it at all. Now, at the start of the third task, um, you know, we have a little scene where Flitwick is conducting the choir just like in the last film. Uh, he's famed as being the one of the greatest uh, wizard duelists alive, and he's very gifted with charms, and in the films, they just make him some cheap music teacher. Um, 
you know, in that same scene, we also have the Bobaton girls uh, s- singing and dancing to the Macarena. It's like nobody actually took this film seriously. I think maybe like they just said like, you know, the last three movies were runaway successes. We don't, you know, we can we can take this one off and still make money. I mean, it, well, I wouldn't pa- put it past WB's executive um, executives to kind of have that opinion, but it just really doesn't pay out or pay off in this movie. You know, and in that third task, they should have included the Sphinx. If you were to just have scary hedges and fog and whatnot, it's like you could have done a two-minute scene with the Sphinx's riddle, and it would have worked. It would have taken no time, and it would have actually made the third third task a little bit more enjoyable. This book has a lot of character development, specifically um, for Sirius Black at the end of the at the end of the book. And the movie doesn't do any of it, which I think takes away a little bit from his death in the next film. Again, if you're only seeing the movies and not reading the books, it, like the Order of the Phoenix does a, the, the vast amount of heavy lifting for the character development um, for Sirius Black. And if this movie did just a little bit more than nothing, which is basically what you got, his death would be even more impactful. Like that's, I think, my why Sirius is one of my favorite characters is because she does such a good job in building him up and developing him as a character. And like, you almost see him as your grad, uh, your, your godfather when you're kind of living vicariously through Harry. Right. So his death is so impactful and just the movie, this movie specifically completely ignores all of that. So it's like, it kind of takes away a little bit from it, um, from that movie, you know, kind of just my thoughts on that. Um, maybe some other people are okay with not including lots of it, but there's some pretty important things that like kind of set up what's going to happen in the order of the Phoenix revolving around, um, series. Uh, if this movie wanted to actually have some good comic relief, um, specifically with Ron at the end of the movie, they should have had him ask for Crumb's autograph. It would have, it would have actually paid off. It would have been like the one piece of comic relief with Ron that actually worked in the movie. Um, the ending of this movie also ignores a lot of explanation of, um, certain really key events and and things are just really glossed over and it's poorly executed by all accounts. If you're, if you're looking at like a side-by-side comparison book to movie, it's like completely botched, probably worse again than any of the film in the series, even though they're trying to fast track lots of, lots of the little things and the trio saying goodbye to one another is just awkward and it really doesn't feel impactful at all given the current circumstances. You know, and one one aspect of the end that I think really would have worked well is showing Harry giving getting the winnings from Crouch and giving them to Fred and George. It would one explain how they're able to open a joke shop in the sixth film. Um, and they could have done this without uh, having to include the blo- the Bagman plot line at all. They could have just said basically that Harry didn't want it and he was just going to give it to the twins. Um, yeah, th- I think that's, that was a missed opportunity. The score in this movie, uh, I've commented on, on the previous ones. Um, John Williams does an incredible job. Like his, his scores are good. Um, the Harry Potter scores are my, f- probably my favorite John Williams music. Obviously, he was not. Uh, he did not score this movie, um, which is which is whatever. Patrick Doyle took over. Um, it's okay. There's lots of repetition. Like you just hear lots of the same themes over and over again. There's not like you could listen to basically um, five minutes of the, of the score, and basically that's all you're going to hear for the rest of the movie. And I know there's you know large shoes to fill with John Williams departing. Um, there's a couple of odd themes that do work well. Like I'm not saying it's terrible, but for the most part, it just goes unnoticed. It's boring when comparing, when comparing, uh, to what John Williams did. Now to some overall comments, uh, this book did, um, better than the prior books in world building. That kind of goes without saying, um, they really made every aspect of the wizarding world feel more lived in in this book. They kind of, she kind of just was able to expand on it a little bit more. I think that's what makes this book a fan favorite and is ultimately a leg up over the prior books. JK took a good leap 
uh, in this book to set up Harry Potter as being a good fantasy series. I think this is the one that really kind of put her over the edge um, in comparison to seeing like, you know, what uh, Tolkien has done or C.S. Lewis or George R.R. R. Martin. Um, she was able, because of the success and the wit and the things that she did specifically in this book, put her over the top. Um, prior to this, I think uh, the other books were really overshadowed thematically by being children's novels, and I think there's a there's a very positive shift in her writing in this book. If Crouch Jr. was uh, able to impersonate Moody to such a level to impress the greatest wizard, that being Dumbledore, I wonder how he prepped to do it in such a good level. Like Crouch had spent essentially a decade in solitary confinement between um, Azkaban and um, living in his father's house. And after he got the mission from Voldemort, did he just start reading up on stories about Moody to understand his history? I know the book explanation is that he kept Moody under the Imperius curse so that he could um, get information from him. But you think Moody being the most famous or ever and, you know, a very powerful wizard that he would have had the skills to be able to fight um, the Imperius curse. I'd also be really mad if I was from Bobaton uh, and uh, Durmstrang and Hogwarts got two champions. Also, what is this binding magical contract, which is the only explanation on why Harry had to compete? Um, also, if Fleur is the best that Bobaton had to offer, uh, they really had no hope in hell in winning this tournament. So the champions are exempt from their final exams, but at least at Hogwarts in the seventh year, the students need to take the NEWTs or the newts uh, to be able to get jobs at the Ministry of Magic. So it seems like kind of an oversight to have them exempt from exams unless you're essentially looking at the glory of being chosen as a um, school champion that it would trump um, the newts and you would get your own type of like notoriety from being a Triwizard um, champion whether you win it or not. It's plausible, but uh, barely in my mind. While at the Yule Ball, Harry's date, uh, Parvati, says that Moody's magical eye shouldn't be allowed, uh, you know, or he shouldn't be allowed to have that magical eye because essentially he can see through clothing and other objects, and that is completely fair. Why would you want some, like, 70-year-old guy with an eye that can see through killed, uh, clothing teaching at a school with minors? Again, there's some kind of creepy things that go on in this um, book and movie. I'll give props to J.K. Rowling. Um, she tackles some social issues and some teen emotions around fitting in and belonging, and she tackles them head on. And it seems with like genuine care. In these, uh, you know, in the age that these books were written, it fits really well. Whether it's half giants, werewolves, Muggleborns, and kind of like everything in between. One theme and aspect that she kind of like puts forth in the wizarding world throughout the books is that everyone should be welcomed and be accepted. Um, and that's that's a really good message to have, especially when you're having like a, a teenage um, um, reading base that, you know, your target market and stuff. Like that's a really good message for kids to have. However, since the series have ended, the wheels have come off that train and social justice warriors have hijacked the narratives. Now, like, the kind words of care in the pages are now like a battle cry for these, these crazy people for or against whatever the progressive message needs to be. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to comment on, on the whole controversy around JK's comments and stuff like that, but there's kind of like an overarching, overarching fact that they want to view Harry Potter as like a, some sort of replacement doctrine for, you know, being able to, get what they want, essentially. They kind of think that anybody who likes Trump is Voldemort. I don't know. It just seems that uh, she, some people took what she said in Harry Potter books and kind of just ran in, in like a very destructive manner. Voldemort's also way more frightening in the books when in comparison to the movie. And I get why, but I think for grown-up kids that grew up with Harry Potter, um, re-watching these movies, it would, it would be more welcome to have like I don't know, some of those sinister, more sinister aspects um, in the movie, I think it would have um, just held up a little bit better. Voldemort, um, Voldemort also doubts Lucius' support, um, yet two years before the events in the Goblet of Fire, he gave Ginny Weasley the diary horcrux as an 
uh, act of faith to try to restore Voldemort in power. And Voldemort just completely ignores this. You can kind of see, like, lots of the aspects of, like, Voldemort hating Lucius and the Malfoy family um, kind of start to um, enter the plot. Voldemort in the graveyard also highlights three Death Eaters that are missing from the crew that shows up. One of them is too cowardly to return, and that's referring to Kakarov, who will be punished. One of them has left them forever, and that's referring to Snape, who Voldemort plans to kill, uh, at least at that point in time. His mind gets changed later. Um, well, uh, kind of, yeah, whatever. Um, and the one who remains faithful is still at Hogwarts, and that's referring to Barty Crouch Jr., whose efforts helped get Harry to the graveyard. Um, again, he doesn't specifically name them, so as to not give away the reveal at the end of the book for those that are reading it. There's also a lot to unpack in these final chapters of the book. Uh, there's all, there is, there's a lot to unpack. It's like a roller coaster of events. You're getting hit with multiple different plot lines, all concluding. And the way that uh, she was able to tie all of these events, in, you know, in a nice bow and present it to the reader was then better than I would probably say any book in this series. The way that she was able to wrap up multiple plot lines and the mystery and and character development and world building in the last few chapters is so well done. And I think this book, at least from my perspective sitting here right now is done better than um, any other of the books that I can remember uh, in the Harry Potter series. Fudge is such an idiot. It's impossible not to look at the evidence and see the truth of the situation, especially in the film. Um, The start of the next movie feels really inconsistent if you haven't read the books because you don't get the context of of, um, Fudge's like um, how upset that Fudge is towards Dumbledore and stuff like that. Um, it plays out differently in the books and, and that's why I feel it might be a little bit of a disconnect, um, from the movies because you don't get that conversation between, um, Fudge and Dumbledore and, and the other characters. The resolution in the book, um, although complex and long-winded, I really do think needed to be included in the film. There's a lot to unpack and great importance to the overall plot, not just of like the book and movie, but as the series of a whole, as a whole, like if this movie, this movie in my mind would score way better uh, if they were able to actually flesh some of this stuff out in the script in a good way rather than just outright ignoring lots of it. I know there's a lot and you know, you're looking at a runtime, but I think this movie could have used another 10 minutes of runtime, you know, just as it is. And if they're able to rework of five to seven minutes of the fluff and unnecessary stuff that didn't really add a whole lot of importance uh, to the to the film, um, such as like the, um, comic relief things revolving around the Yule ball, um, just unnecessary or or drawn out scenes, especially considering the amount of school that they skipped in, in, in class time and stuff like that. They could have got a lot better of an explanation of the plot, such as, um, you know, what took uh, telling the audience what actually took place in the graveyard events with Barty Crouch Jr. And the, and the big plot twist, uh, Sirius's character development, or even like putting Dobby in the movie. His death in the seventh film is so impactful amongst fans, and it's like one of like the key deaths, not just in the book, um, but in the movies as well, has such impact. And um, he really doesn't po- like in the books. He's constantly there, so Harry has a lot more of a relationship with Dobby. But um, but yeah, I think they really did need to include him in in this movie. Um, you know, some of these things, I I really wonder how much of this movie was just left on the cutting room floor or, you know, just completely scratched out, um, in the original drafts of the script or something like that. There are also multiple fan theories that I think are all plausible on Voldemort's intention on having the cup being a port key, um, and allowing the the person to return to Hogwarts. I kind of think that Voldemort uh, wanted to use Polyjuice, po- por- uh, bleh, excuse me, Polyjuice Potion to become Harry and then kill Dumbledore and really kick off the Wizarding War with a bang. Now, after reading this book and rewatching the movie, it's no surprise uh, that this book usually tops lists, uh, you know, is at the top of the list for fans. Um, my big takeaway of it, especially kind of looking at things through more of a critical eye, I just really wish that this movie was better. And that's it for the review of The Goblet of Fire. Let me know in the comments your thoughts on the film. Do you agree with uh, with me in saying that, uh, you know, the book was really good, but the movie was the worst in the series? 
Also, if you have only seen the movie and not read the books, how does this movie play out for you? I'm sure that there's more positives uh, in the film that I might have overlooked, but I remember even as a kid that thinking that this movie had some major problems. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you like my review, share this episode with another Harry Potter fan, give this video a like, and subscribe for more content. Constant vigilance. If you want to know what a man is like, take a good look at how he treats his inferiors, not his equals. You must all face the choice between what is right and what is easy. Stay free. Thank you for listening to the Schmidt House podcast. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so by sending Bitcoin. The wallet address is in the description box below. I would really appreciate it as I try to keep the podcast ad free and it helps me cover production costs. The Schmidt House podcast is available on the following services, YouTube, Rumble, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Please like, share, and subscribe, and, en and enable the notifications, but most importantly, share this podcast with a friend by copying the link and sending it to them personally. Check out the description box for more information about things I discussed on this episode and how to get in contact with me. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions or suggestions that you may have, including topics that you would like to hear me discuss. Take it easy and have a good day.